Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up and a bunch of you wrote in to tell me about some new policy changes that Google made in regards to how your photos are stored. So I thought we would talk about that because it goes well beyond photos actually. So you're probably going to want to tune in for that part. And I'm also going to rant a little bit about all of the stranded photo albums I have that are sitting in the derelicts of old software that is no longer supported. Let's get to it. So let's begin with the big changes to the Google Photos storage. This will all take effect on June 1st. There's a pretty extensive blog post that details exactly what will happen after June 1st, but basically what they're changing here is the free storage that they used to provide for what they called high quality images. So if you had a photo that was 16 megapixels or lower, it would be stored in Google Photos without eating up any space that you've purchased from Google. So I have the 100 gigabytes of Google One storage and all of my high quality photos don't count against that. They're basically showing up as zero uh, for storage. And they also have been storing 1080p or lower videos for free as well. And again, neither one of those things would eat into your storage allocation. If you were uploading images that were the original quality that were above 16 megapixels, those would count, but everything else did not. And that is what they're gonna be changing on June 1st. So after June 1st, photos and videos that are high quality will now also count towards your Google account storage allocation but your existing photos are grandfathered in. So if you have stuff from June 1st back, uh, those photos will still be at zero, but anything else rolling forward will be counted against your allocation. Now, I have not been using Google Photos as my primary photo app, uh, primarily because it didn't support uh, raw images in the past, but I have been using it as a backup. So I have my iPhone here set to sync up automatically with Google Photos by converting the images into the free high quality mode first. And it will do that for my photos and any video clips that I shoot with my phone. And another reason I've been using Google Photos is that because it is syncing up my entire iCloud library through my phone, it's a great index. The search on Google Photos is better than I've ever seen on any other application. So for example, here I search for Siberian Husky and it finds examples of Siberian Huskies in any of the photos that it has in the library. And it's very good at finding the Husky in the images. Uh, here's another example. This is one I did of a search for Mercedes Benz. And if we go through here, you can see even with the logo obscured, it was able to pick out that uh, Mercedes SUV there in the NASA parking lot. So it's really amazing just how well it works. And oftentimes I'm going to Google Photos to look for a photo that I know is somewhere in my Apple library because the search is that good. And I suspect that for many years it made sense for Google to provide this free storage so that they would have a lot of images to train their AI. Uh, but perhaps they feel like it's been trained well enough and now this is really starting to cost them money, which is why they're going to start essentially charging for storage. And in their blog post, Google did give us some information about the extent of the storage demands that they're under. So Google Photos currently has four trillion photos on their servers and they're adding 28 billion new photos and videos every week. And I'm guessing that's kind of an exponential curve that they're seeing here, which is probably leading them to make this decision. Uh, the other factor here is the amount of gigabytes required across all of their different services. Uh, so what they're saying here on another blog post is that there are 4.3 million gigabytes of data added across Gmail, Google Drive, and Photos every day. I can't even imagine what that's gotta be like to keep up with. Uh, and that's, of course, driving, I'm guessing, a lot of this move here to start charging for storage in some way. Now, this is not the only change that's happening because they're also making some big changes to how Google Docs and Sheets and all the other Google apps are working with storage as well. So what's going to happen here after June 1st is that we've got those high quality photos counting against your storage capacity and anything created in the Google suite of applications like Google Docs and Google Sheets is also now going to count against your quota. It never did before, no matter how big the document was. 
So for example, we've got a big spreadsheet we've been keeping for the last seven or eight years for all of the benchmarking data that we have here on the channel. It's not huge from a file size perspective. I think it's just under a megabyte. But on Google Sheets, it always shows up as zero for its size because it's been a native Google document. After June 1st, if I edit that document once, its storage will now count against my quota. So any old file you have is fine, but if you edit that file, it suddenly will count. And some of these files can get pretty big, especially on their slideshow applications. So be prepared because it's not just photos. It's all of the stuff sitting in your Google Docs, Sheets, Slides, and everything else. Also, let's say I had a huge document that I shared with somebody years ago. If they happen to pop into it and make one little change, maybe they just hit the Enter key by accident, now that document's changed and it's going to count against my storage quota, and you might quickly fill things up. Now, what happens if you go over your storage quota? Well, you can't upload new files to Google Drive. Uh, you can't, of course, upload any photos to Google Photos. You might have people emailing you and getting bounce messages saying that your quota is filled up. Uh, you won't be able to create any new files in any of the Google applications. And the other thing that they're warning you about here is that if you are over your storage quota for two years and don't do anything about it, they're going to start deleting files. Now, they're going to give you plenty of time and plenty of warning about this, but this is another big change that if you have your quota exhausted for two years and you don't do anything to fix it, they may start deleting files as they see fit to free up storage. They're getting really serious here about controlling the storage growth on their systems. And I also read that Google is getting more aggressive about idle accounts. In other words, accounts that you haven't logged into in a year or two. And from what I'm reading, they are going to be looking at dormancy on a service by service basis. So if you have an account that you log into and check Gmail every once in a while, it'll be fine with Gmail. But if you have a bunch of photos stored there and you haven't looked at that photo library in two years, they might delete your photos but keep your Gmail. So you're going to want to keep up on your logins to not only the Google account itself, but all of the services that it's using because Google really is looking to purge some data here and free up some of their hard drive space. You do have the ability to buy your way out of this storage problem, of course. And Google for consumers has Google One. Uh, they have Google Workspace for commercial users, formerly Google Suites, formerly Google Apps. Um, so there are two different types of services depending on the type of user that you are. But generally, if you're a consumer, this is what you're going to look for, Google One. And I have right now the 100 gigabyte plan, mostly because my Gmail account I've had since 2004, and it's just filled up with stuff. Uh, there are ways to mitigate the storage on your accounts, and there are tools that Google provides to do that. Uh, but I like to keep stuff, and so I'm paying for that 100 gigabytes, and I'm constantly battling that. Uh, they do have a 200 gigabyte plan that costs $10 more per year. Uh, you do get 3% back in the Google Store, so that might be valuable if you buy a lot of Google hardware. Uh, and then it goes from like 200 gigs to 2 terabytes, and there's not much in between here. I thought maybe something in the $5 per month range might be reasonable, but it just jumps from 200 to 2 terabytes here. Uh, and that is your current options that you have available. But you can buy a lot of storage from Google if you need it. And on the higher tiers, you get 10% back on the Google Store, and now they're giving some other enticements like a VPN service for Android phones and whatnot. Now, I would not go out and buy more storage yet. I would wait until June 1st and see what the impact of your usage is going to be on your quota rolling forward. Because again, on June 1st, everything that you had before June 1st is grandfathered, so you're not going to be suddenly out of space. So take a look. Give it a month and just see what your normal usage does to that quota and then figure out if you want to go for the extra storage to buy yourself some more time. Uh, the other option, of course, is to get a network-attached storage device like I have in my back room over there, and you can host it all yourself. But of course, that requires a little bit more work for backup and everything else. But again, I would just wait a little bit and see what the impact will be on your usage uh, once this June 1st date passes. Now, Google is not the only one that's made some changes that impacted freeloaders like me. Uh, so I've had a free Dropbox account probably for the last decade or so, and I got on super early. So I sent down all of those invitation codes to friends, and I think every time you added somebody to your Dropbox account, they gave you like 250 megabytes or 500 megabytes of storage for free. So I went from whatever that 5 gig thing they start you with all the way up to like 15 gigabytes of storage. 
And I was using Dropbox as the repository for all of the things that I was actively working on. And it would just sync up across all of my different computers. I had no reason to upgrade anything. And that was until I bought a new computer and added a few more devices to my account. And suddenly, they limited uh, my usage to three devices. And it just came out of nowhere in March of 2019. Uh, so Dropbox immediately became less useful for me, and I could, of course, increase the number of devices if I wanted to pay into it. They obviously had some of the same storage uh, pressures that Google is experiencing here, uh, but I went and found an alternative, which I'll talk about in a minute. I also encountered some issues with Flickr in the past. So I was using Flickr back around 2005, 2006, and I had paid whatever annual fee they charged back then to get the Pro account. So you wouldn't have any limitations, and I was happy to pay that fee. And then Flickr, in you know, competition with Google and others out there, decided to basically give everyone a terabyte for free. And I said, well, what do I need the Pro account for now? So I dropped the Pro account and just started using the service as I was using it. Uh, and then all of a sudden, they changed uh, their course on that. And now they only allow you to store 1,000 photos. So now I am in an over quota situation with Flickr. And I got this message when I logged into it the other day. So I've got to go out and uh, clean out my Flickr account to get those photos uh, out of jail here. Uh, but this is the kind of stuff that changes from one year to the next with all of these services. And sometimes when something is free, it feels like it's too good to be true. And I think as we're seeing here, there is no free ride in this world. And yes, those free things were probably too good to be true. So I'm going to try to start consolidating things into an area that works best for me. So what am I using now? Well, this is what I've got going on for uh, most of my stuff. Now, I do have a Google Workspace account. Again, this used to be called G Suite, formerly Google Apps. And I have that for the lon.tv domain because we have uh, two part-timers that work for me here on the channel. So that's how I communicate with them. That's how we share files. And what's nice is that I have this separate account that has all of my uh, YouTube stuff on it, separate from all my personal stuff. And that's been working really well for me. So I pay a monthly fee for that. I get 30 gigabytes of storage with Google for the entry level fee that I'm paying. And the problem with Google Workspace is that I have to upgrade everybody to get myself a storage upgrade. So if I want to get you know, the higher tier service on my Google Workspace account, I have to upgrade not only my account from six to 12 bucks a month, but all the other accounts at the same time. So from a cost standpoint, it doesn't make sense for me to do that. Now I replaced Dropbox with something called SyncThing. And this is an open source project. It runs on almost everything. It doesn't run on the iPhone, but there's apps for Android. It runs on my Synology NAS, and it works just like Dropbox does. You save a file on your local file system on your computer, and once that file is unlocked, it will then copy it to all the other computers in your sync thing chain. It's got really good collision control, so if the file is open in two different places, you don't have a collision there. It stores two different versions of the document. I found it to be really good. Uh, it does require a little bit of setup and understanding as to how it works. It's not as seamless as a, as a Dropbox account might be. So I was going to go with the stuff that was built into my Synology NAS. They have a great cloud syncing thing that works really well. But it does require that you have either a hole punched in your router for the computer to log into when it's off-site, uh, or you have to have a constant VPN connection on the Synology side. Uh, this will work. Uh, through your NAT router using some relay servers that the Sync Thing project maintains. And if you don't want to use those relay servers for security reasons, you can decide not to. Um, but everything is encrypted, and I found it to be a really good solution. And I'm going to do a video on it at some point in the near future. It's a little bit of a learning curve to it, but I have really, really been happy with it. And I don't miss Dropbox at all. And the convenience is really, really good. So I'm very happy with Sync Thing. And we'll talk more about that soon. Now, I know a bunch of you are going to roll your eyes on this one, but I am paying for an iCloud account. I'm doing the $10 a month, two terabyte plan. And I have my family in on that as well. So we share that two terabyte pool. By the way, Google One has a similar option. So you can spend one money on a Google One storage allocation that you can share with your family members. I think they give you five people you can share that with. And I'm using Apple Photos for all of my photo management. And I'm really happy with this solution because Apple Photos from the get-go supported raw images. I shoot a lot on my Nikon camera, not as much as I used to, but I do have a ton of raw images from the time when I was really using that camera a lot. 
and I always shoot raw when I use that Nikon. And what's nice is that no matter what device I'm using to bring in that raw image, Apple Photos supports it. So I can plug it into my iPad, it brings it right in, it syncs it up across the board. If I bring in a bunch of images on my computer, I can then take the iPad out with the Apple Pencil and make some adjustments to it. The second I stop those adjustments, it syncs it up non-destructively across all of my other devices. It's so good for me, and I am very, very happy with it. Some of you may have other solutions that work better, but for me, I am totally happy with Apple Photos and my iCloud plan. And if I have to pay for one, this is the one I'm really going to pay for on top of my uh, low cost 100 gigabyte account from Google. Uh, what's nice about Apple Photos is that it's got a lot of neat extensions. So it's gotten a lot better uh, over the last couple of years because you can link it up with more advanced photo apps. So it's been really, really good for me. And again, I'm really happy with it. And I take most of my photos now with my iPhone and videos for that matter. So it's just nice to know that when uh, this thing is at home plugged in somewhere, it's just syncing up to the cloud and everything is safely backed up and then available across all devices. They've really come up with a good solution there. And the family plan is great also because my wife's phone, uh, her iPad, and then the kids' iPads are all also syncing up to this iCloud account and everybody's backed up. So if some device disappears, we've got everything right back where we started from. So that's been really good. But I do have a problem, and I would love to get uh, some feedback from you as to how you're organizing photos, because I have been taking digital photos since 1998. I bought a Kodak DC-120 my senior year of college, and I've got some great digital photos from that. I like just documenting my life, you know, with images, so I've just got so many pictures. And for a long time, I was just storing stuff in folders. And then around 98 or so, I found Adobe Photoshop album, which I was using uh, quite extensively. And then they dropped support from it. And then I was busy with a whole bunch of stuff going on professionally. So I never got around to moving it over to their Photoshop elements or whatever. And for whatever reason, I could not get my Photoshop album to migrate to whatever Adobe was having people migrate to. So I'm kind of like, just abandoned there. I have all the images, that's fine, but all of the organization that I did on those images is pretty much lost at this point, and all those things are just sitting in a big folder somewhere, and I haven't had time really to go through and organize things, unfortunately. And then I started using Flickr, and that was great up until we had that whole issue with the pro account and the free thing, and now it's not so free, so I've got to get my images out of that. And again, I'll get the images, but largely lose some of the organization I had with them, so that's another issue. Uh, and then when I got my Mac going around 2007, I, I switched to Mac when they supported Intel so I could still run my, uh, my Windows apps. I was using iPhoto, and then I went over to Aperture, which was their pro-level photo organizing software, which I loved quite a bit. And what I liked about it was that I could keep a lot of different libraries depending on the topic that I was shooting. So I had some consulting work I was doing. I had libraries for each client. It was, it was a great application. And then, of course, Apple abandoned Aperture. In fact, you can't even load it up as of Mac OS X Catalina. The good news is that Apple Photos now apparently will load in those old Aperture libraries. I did load up a few of the smaller ones today just to see if it worked, and it did work, so I'll see if it can work with the larger ones. So that'll probably solve my Aperture and iPhoto problem, but not the older stuff. And now I'm using Apple Photos as of 2015, and we'll see how long that lasts for. But what happens is, is that you, know, you get some great organizational strategy. It's working wonderfully. The software is great. And then the company decides to abandon it for whatever reasons. And then you're stranded with these photos all over the place. And it's driving me nuts. So I just would love to hear what uh, you all are using. I did ask a number of years ago. And the responses were all over the map. There doesn't seem to be a quintessential you know, one photo app to rule them all. And I'd like to hear from you as to how you're organizing your photos and how far back they're going and if you have any stranded photos too. So it looks like the free ride is over. So get ready to start paying either for a subscription service or a big old NAS device. Now this week's wrap up is being brought to you by all of you. We have two super chatters who contributed during our live streams this week. They include Thomas Anfang and Mark Dell. We also had two new supporters on the channel, including Frank Lewandowski, who's our latest Gold Level supporter. He'll be announced on the end credits starting next month. And we have a new Floatplane subscriber, Railworks2. 
uh, who subscribe via that new platform we're uploading to. I want to thank everyone for their contributions this week, along with everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis, and all of you who watch on a regular basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth. Now, if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lawntv slash support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution. We also support the YouTube membership program with that join button down below. And of course, we're on Patreon like all the cool YouTubers are. And our latest venture here is on Floatplane. This was started up by Linus Tech Tips to have a place that they could host video themselves. And they've allowed other tech, support, or tech creators like me to come on their platform and post their content. So I've been doing that. And so far, 14 of you have signed up there. So thank you all for your continued support. So this week on the channel, we had two live streams. One was our latest Amazon Deal Dash, which included a good deal on a JBL Boombox, the Garmin Phoenix 5X smartwatch, and the Mobile Pixels Trio. Uh, these are gonna happen from time to time because I've been doing some live streaming with Amazon, and they're gonna start sending stuff here that's gonna be on sale, and during the stream, you can get in on the deal. Uh, so we'll have a few more of those things coming up. It was actually a lot of fun. We had a bunch of people on YouTube watching at the same time on Amazon. Had my best uh, live stream audience ever between the two platforms there. That was a lot of fun to do. Uh, and uh, if you want to get notified as to when we do those, definitely click on my notification bell or sign up for the email list. I'll try to get more notifications going out. Uh, the next one is going to be on Cyber Monday. And we also did a live stream unboxing the new Surface Laptop Go and the Raspberry Pi 400. On the Extras channel, we had the videos that we shot during the live stream uploaded. And as you can see, that Raspberry Pi and the Microsoft Surface Go have a lot of interest. So we'll be getting uh, the reviews of the Surface Go up very shortly. On the main channel, we did review the Raspberry Pi 400. I think this thing is a really innovative a solution here from the Raspberry Pi Foundation because this is the first time they've come up with something affordable that works out of the box. It comes in a really cool kit that has an awesome book to take you from nothing to programming it. It's amazing. It's great stuff. It is a Raspberry Pi at its heart, but again, you can take it out of the box, plug it in, and turn it on, and you're good to go. There's nothing else to do. And it really reminds me a lot of the Commodore 64 or the Timex Sinclair that I've got behind me. It is awesome, and you can check out uh, the full review down below in the master playlist. And I think this is definitely going to be one of our products of the year. Uh, we also took a look at the Roku Stream Bar, and a lot of you wrote in about the new support for uh, Apple's uh, AirPlay 2, which we're going to cover separately uh, later this week or early next week. So stay tuned for that. We'll see how it works with the Stream Bar. I purposely did not include it for two reasons. One is that it was announced after I shot the video, uh, but also because this is a feature that's not unique to the Stream Bar, I wanted to cover it as a Roku feature. So be on the lookout. We'll get that going soon. And then we had a lousy laptop, the Jumper EasyBook X3. I do like to look at these cheap laptops every once in a while to see if they're getting any better. It actually has gotten better, but it's still not something I will recommend unless you're desperate. So this week on the channel, we've got a bunch of stuff. Again, we're going to try to get the review shot of that Surface Laptop Go, which is Microsoft's little 12-inch Windows device. I'm looking forward to integrating that into my workflow very shortly. Uh, the folks from 8BitDo sent over the new arcade stick that they just came up with, and I know a lot of you were interested in that. So we're going to have a live stream uh, with me testing it and then a review that will be a lot shorter uh, shortly thereafter. I am getting in, I'm so excited about this, I'm getting in my new MacBook Air later this week with the new M1 processor. I think that's coming in Thursday or Friday. So once it gets here, we'll unbox it live and start running tests on it. My approach is going to be to look at how well it does the stuff that I do on my Mac all the time so we can see how well it handles video editing and some of the other stuff. And I purposely bought the fanless MacBook Air to see what the low-end one would do. Uh, so stay tuned, that's coming up. And then again, we're going to try to look at the Apple AirPlay stuff with the Roku Ultra. And then the next review we'll have up, because it's already shot, is of the AMD-powered Legion 5 from Lenovo. It looks exactly the same as the Intel version, but it's got an AMD processor versus the Intel. And we'll look and see how this one benchmarks versus that one. Now, if you want to get notified anytime I go live or do anything else here on the channel, click the bell and you will get that notification. We have a bunch of other channels, including that Floatplane channel. And if you're still watching, I would really love for you to head over to my Amazon page at lon.tv slash Amazon shop. Uh, you're going to find all of my videos there now. Uh, you'll also find my live streams when we do them there. And there's a follow button on that 
uh, page. So when there are things happening on Amazon that I'm doing, you'll get notified of those as well. Uh, so they're doing a lot more with independent creators there, and I'm happy to be over there. So definitely sign up and follow me there too. If you want to engage with the channel, you can sign up for my very infrequent email list at lon.tv slash email. We still have the Facebook group, of course, which is always buzzing. So head on over there. We've got over a thousand people that you can chat with. And then we have my store where I sell previously used items. I finally got two items listed that already sold. And if you want to be notified every time that we add something to the store, you can go to lon.tv slash store alert and get an email to let you know what has been added so you don't miss out. There's only one of everything because these are the actual devices we reviewed here on the channel. And that is going to do it for now. Thank you all for your continued support and viewership. I forgot to give you an update last week on our close contact COVID situation. Uh, the good news for us is that everybody in the house, including my daughter, tested negative. My daughter had the close contact. She's fine. Most of her classmates are fine. And those that were infected are getting better. So everybody's in good shape. Uh, but we're going to keep safe here. We're not going to go out unless we have to. And of course, keep the masks on and socially distance ourselves. This thing is real. My sister-in-law has it now. So it's something that uh, you really got to protect yourself and others from. So that'll do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Jim Peter, Tom Albrecht, and Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.